So if you're on the road to reprogramming, deprogramming, again, programming your reality, <laughs> we have a wonderful guest today. Our guest today is Miss Eden Cause. Welcome, darling. Thank you. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, I love your story. So Eden has been on this path and I want to talk about your near-death experience because that I'm guessing that is what was the boom for your path, what sparked your, or maybe not. Let, tell us more no, about but, that. Oh yeah. You want to go right into that? Yeah. Let's go right into your near-death experience. Okay. Well, hello everybody. I'm so, again, so glad to be here with Denny Van. Uh, I have been in the energetic world of, you know, I'm a psychological empath, intuitive work with, you know, connect with spirits and energy and all of that. So I had been doing that for probably 14 years. So I was in it. I had my own meditation studio where we offer, I mean, this, this was big. So I live in Akron, Ohio. There are not meditation studios in Akron, Ohio. There might be yoga studios. Sure. There are a lot of those, but a meditation studio to me, that was a really big deal. So I had the studio, I had people working with me and my background is in advertising. So I was doing a lot of the advertising you know, marketing and, you know, talking about the people that worked with me. So a large percentage of my time was spent doing that. So within a week, I remember we had a, a, a class at a school, which is really great about Reiki. And I mean, pretty amazing. And I started feeling a little, little dizzy. So from that Monday to Friday, Friday, I couldn't get out of bed. And for me too, I had to cancel classes, which I don't cancel classes. I don't do any of that. So at one point, <laughs> finally, so my, I divorced my husband. So my husband at the time uh, was like, Some, something's wrong with you. Let, come on, let's just go to the doctor. So we went to the doctor. They stated that I probably had a really heavy duty migraine. And then if I was not feeling better the next day to go to the hospital, to the emergency room. So we ended up going to the emergency room and within, there was no one there which was awesome. I laid on the floor and a woman came up to me, the, the receptionist, and she's like, oh, the floor is so dirty. You don't want to be there. And I was just sitting there going, I do not care. I could sniff all the germs right off the floor. You do not understand what pain I'm in. So anyway, they within 15 minutes, there was this diagnosis of stage four lung cancer. And oh, we got a connection unstable. Are we okay? I can still hear you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So where were, okay. So, uh, stage four lung cancer and you were on the floor and you're, she's like, it's dirty. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't care. And if my husband hadn't gotten me out of bed, like it had gotten to the point where I didn't care about living anymore. Like I didn't want to get up to eat the light hurt. Like my head was pounding. So what it turns out specifically was I had a lesion in my lung and three in my brain. Okay, which is so interesting, Denny, because I also, all my work deals with expansion of the brain, everything in the brain, crazy, crazy good. So after, okay, this is a long part of it. There were four diagnoses. It was not stage four lung, lung cancer. And when you're given that diagnosis, usually 5% of people given that diagnosis live five years and then kaput. So it's essentially, you know, handing you a life sentence. And it was so interesting where I was at that point being incredibly spiritual and none of this was scary. Like, Oh, okay. Well, stage four lung cancer, at least that explains why I'm feeling so awful. Okay. So we'll deal with this. So all of it was taken, I want to say lightheartedly in essence. Yeah, but it was. And it was so interesting to go through a Western medicine protocol, because when you're hit with something that quickly, an emergency, you don't really have any choices. And then I also had this husband who was very, you know, Western medicine, you know, so if I had said, oh, I want to go to my homeopath or whatever, he'd be like, no. So I just kind of, I went with a flow yet used all my tools, even though they're more than just tools you know, to help, help with this process. So the long term of this process, it took two years to heal from, uh, was in the hospital for over a month and a half, had two brain surgeries. I had to relearn how to talk. And that, 
that didn't take very long and relearn how to walk. I mean, and I'm already pretty thin. So I lost probably 20 pounds. So it shows you, and I exercised and I was healthy. It shows you within two weeks, how you can go from, I mean, I was a stick. <laughs> oh, hold on. Rambunctious place. There's a lot going on there. I didn't, ex I was in the ICU a lot. I didn't experience the rambunctiousness, but this nice I, night I did. And it was the only night I was alone at night in the hospital. And after that, I was like, no, no more. Someone's always going to be with me. So I woke up around one o'clock, you know, and just coming from, I've never been, had a brain surgery before, just coming out of it, you're kind of groggy. And I couldn't like, my door was open. So there was a um, protector there, just a, a sheet, and I could hear everything going on in the ICU. Someone had just come in, had fallen off a ladder or something, even at one in the morning or fallen, something happened and they were a quadriplegic, like, not, and I, I just knew this, people were crying. There was yelling. I mean, it was like watching hell and there was nothing I could do about it. I tried to find the nurse button to click it. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't talk. So I just had to sit there and listen. And then there were nurses laughing. So it was the complete juxtaposition of life on earth. Then this voice came down. So there was no light and oh my gosh, and you're going to see everybody that died and come on just this, this voice. And I knew it was God that basically said, Hey, Hey, you tap me on the shoulders. Okay. You see everything that life has to bring. And if you want Eden, you can, you can go totally fine if you choose to go. And a part of that was, I was totally cool with my family. There was nothing that needed to be tied up that I could go if I wanted to. And it would, and, and there was this expression It'll be so easy, like a snap of the fingers. You won't feel anything. And oh yeah, let me tell you, it's going to be great. It over here, great. Yet, if you also choose, you can choose to stay. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy because it's not. Because in the surgery too, they basically said, oh, we don't, when you come out of the surgery, you might not be able to use your arms and legs. You might not be able to move your mouth. You know, all these possibilities of what am I going to be like when, when I fully come to terms with what the surgery has done. So again, you make the decision, whatever you make is fine. There's no, you must do this. You must do that. No. So I uh, was on a podcast a while back and it was beautiful. He compared it to being asked if you want a hamburger or pizza. I mean, it was pretty much like that. Like, Hey, we're giving you these two choices. Which one do you want? So obviously, I, yes. Uh, yes. So obviously I decided to stay and I was listening to one of your podcasts about um, death and the whole thing about that. Like I wasn't scared of death or anything yet this just really catapulted me i guess you would call it that into a whole other realm of acceptance of of god and spirit and because of this my whole work world changed the studio that was my baby and i had my kids at the time were 14 and 10 years old two little girls because of all this, and I've had in, in the past when I needed to make a change, have been spiritually hit on the head because I didn't listen. Okay, so this infection hit literally hit me on the head, but yet there were so many things that I feel I also needed to experience to experience being in the hospital, having a, you know, uh, infection that is deadly you know, Western medicine drugs. Oh my gosh. I have stories on those as well. So what this catapulted me into, uh, you're shaking your head. Tell me, tell me about that. Girl, we have so much in common. I mean, I was told <laughs> I'd be dead in two years if I didn't do the traditional medicine. And I said, no. And fortunately my husband, and we're still married, but he yes. supported me um, so definitely there's this voice inside that told me that's not for you, but I had no idea what was. Wow. So what were you presented with? Cancer. Malignant oh. melanoma. Okay. So, so if I didn't go through chemo and radiation, I'd be dead in two years. 
So what did you do? No, I didn't go through chemotherapy and radiation. I just went on a journey. I said, well, it's time to do some searching. And two years came and went, you know, and it, uh, next year I just celebrated 21 years. Oh, so is that your turning point? I was spiritual before then as well. But the thing is, is I wasn't doing it right. I was programmed wrong. <laughs> So I had to do some reprogramming. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, For me, it's so interesting too. So my company is called Just Be. So this, this made me, let's put it that way, Just Be. Because I had a chair, I had um, infusions to get like three, three times a day that took over an hour. I could not do anything. I couldn't, all I could do was just sit and just be. So that also helped me in terms of what are you all about? This is really about walking your walk, talking your talk. So here it is. And I beautifully, oh my gosh, this is a long story, Denny as well. So I was in this beautiful studio that I had been given for free. I mean, a corporate, I had a a dentist on the side of me where my first studio, there was like a handyman um, in the Kruger shopping plaza. So Freddy Kruger, like it was, yeah. At the place that I had my studio in, there was a window in the back, like a guy would go out and pee out of the back window. I mean, yeah. So I had the studio for free for seven months, beautiful, but knew it was only a short time this infection came on during that. So I didn't have to worry about rent. I didn't have to worry about anything. And when I was recovering, it was time for us to move locations. Okay. The free location was five minutes from my house. This new location was 30 minutes and not realizing when you've had brain surgery and your brain is a little kooky, driving to be able to drive takes a while. Okay. And the only after effect that I had was in my peripheral vision, I do have some dark spots. So driving at night, uh, any rain or any snow right now, don't, I don't do it. So little, little did I was like, okay, let's have the studio 30 minutes away. And, you know, I might have a session at nine and then one at three o'clock. So drive there an hour and then go back there an hour later in the day. So that alone was not productive. And it really made me realize that I needed to let the studio go because it was also sucking time that wasn't what I needed to be doing. So went back to having my own studio at home and I am in it and the podcast and doing doing everything that I love. So it did, it did so many things for me. It, it basically, you know, cause uh, the studio, as I talked about, it was my baby. It was my dream, if you would call it that. And to see that it's not really important. You can let it go. You don't have to have this name. You don't have to, and I'm pretty business businessy. So I liked that. And I liked being corporate and I like, you know, and I like bringing this woohoo side to the corporate side. I thought that was amazing. And I was going to be the one to do it. And then just realize it was all not important. So there you go. What other questions do you have for me about that? (laughs) That it's not important and it doesn't matter. What's important is what do you want to do next? And, and I found that coming from a space of serving others. And Mm -hmm. so I'm in the service industry, a very specialized niche. We talked a little bit before what I do And um, so I'm in a very niche position and being able to learn what I was learning at the time when I was diagnosed, Yeah, it was on my birthday in 2001 in June. So I was dealing with all kinds of doctor's appointments and what I was going to do when the whole world changed in September of 2001. So I was driving on my way to work and I worked at Motorola in Chicago at the time. So, uh, you know, I was at the top of my career and then. Okay. Let me, let me drink all this in for a second. Okay. All right. Like you said, you come to realize none of it matters. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, my inner world is exploding and changing and my outer world is (laughs) exploding and changing. (laughs) Yes, literally. And it's like, okay, well, here we are. (laughs) 
-hmm. and none of it matters. I love that. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the basics of what I was supposed to be dedicating my time to versus all this extraneous stuff that really, what it really wasn't what I should be doing. I remember there's one day I was writing down how or typing in how many classes we're going to have. I think it took me an hour and then I would bring the sheets and put them in the studio. You know, I really, as I look back now, I'm like, what, what were you doing? And I was the one supporting everybody else too. Um, Yeah, it was just, yeah, it was, it was an, an eye opener in many aspects. Absolutely. And you talk a little bit about here, um, writing for the Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I used to, I don't anymore. Book and stuff like that. So when you're working with clients, you know, somebody who is realizing that, you know, they've got some of these changes to make, you mentioned in here, um, intuitive energy healer, vibrational healing, Mm -hmm. um, meditation, mindfulness, Mm -hmm. Your methods. Let's talk about your methods yeah. in getting okay. someone in a space of going into that whole other realm to reprogram, to create health, healing, you know? Okay. Okay. And this is interesting to talk about because it's hard to put words to it because it's it's definitely not classical. So I, I told Denny from the beginning, my I was in my late twenties was in advertising and was just totally off balance. Like I, I loved my job, but was working probably 70 to 80 hours a week. Things were just not fitting. So I ended up going out to dinner with two of my friends and they basically told me about my soon to be, I'll call her a teacher. And, and she was a meditation teacher, but it wasn't that I had no interest in meditation. I loved how they described her that she was just unbelievable. And I was like, oh, okay, that is where I need to go. So that started me in this healing. And I, when I started with her, she was a former, she uh, was a doctor, former psychologist, left the typical psychology world because she realized that, you know, through talk therapy, we could talk about anything and you could talk and realize exactly what is not working for you, but yet to do it on an energetic level, that was not possible with that methodology. So for six years, you know, so change doesn't happen where the problem is. So you could talk about the problem where the problem is and no change is going to (laughs) happen. Exactly. Like, like medicine, you can take a pill, but that may numb things or, but it doesn't get to the, the core issue. So I had worked with her for six years. Uh, My husband uh, got a job in Alabama. So I was in Georgia at the time. I'm from Georgia. And she, she goes, Eden, you need to start teaching now. And I was like, you know, it was one of those things. I was just like, what? Yeah. And then I started and a party was like, oh yeah, this totally fits. Oh my gosh. So it, uh, I started out doing group, group work, which is what my uh, mentor did and moved to more individual. And it is, it is like therapy, yet I am not a classical therapist. It it is like therapy on drugs. So I've had many people come to me who have worked with PhDs and been in therapy for years. And after one session, they're like, oh my gosh, I got more out of this one session than, so we do talk, we talk about things and being a psychological empath. When you talk to me, I can feel where it is in your body. I can feel the emotions that are locked in your body. And this is not cookie cutter. Like every body, every process is different because we can get. I can uh, sometimes. Hear you. Okay. Sometimes there's a parallel life. Sometimes there's someone who's died that we need to work on that. I mean, it can, it can cover so many bases. So once we talk, I work on them spiritually, energetically. Then when we get off the table or they get off the table, come back and sit down and talk about it. So it is, it, how how do I even explain it? There is something about it that helps people unlock the depth of their challenges and their issues that nothing else can. So when they talk about it, we work together, they come and sit with me and we talk about again, things change. I've had, especially right now, uh, teenagers, and I work with all ages, all backgrounds. I've had some teenagers that have had some major anxiety, can't live the house. And with them, like three sessions, 
they're good to go. Uh, I had someone with an eating or disorder and, you know, Western medicine basically says, once you have an eating disorder or once you have alcohol, you know, alcoholism in your life or drug addiction, you're going to have that for the rest of your life. My, my work is no, we're going to go through the root cause. And again, her root cause happened. She was in her thirties when she started seeing me happened when she was younger. So 30 years of just, so there was a lot to un unpack and where I believe the frequencies are in our world today. And the fact that we are expanding and growing, everyone is supported more than ever with getting the stuff off of you. And I encourage people to now is the time. If you have something that's holding you back, because we right now are in this 3D world transitioning to what I believe 5D world, it's about losing victimhood, losing, you know, this, this, you know, I can't do this because I'm a woman or I'm black or, you know, really letting go of those divisions and finding out who you are. Hey, society may say these things about you, but who are you? And let's clear all this junk off you, all these beliefs that are not real and not true, like talking about my beliefs. And, and then we can get to the, to the heart of things. So I am Denny very, um, I'm, I'm very challenging and I do it with love. Um, one of my clients called me like a gentle bulldo gentle bulldozer. I I'm very select with what I tell you. Cause I also get images and things. So I, I, I don't just blurt out everything I get. I'm very good. I guess that's a word of isolating what needs to be said yet. If there's something that I know is going to be hard, I, and I'm supposed, and I feel everything in me that I, this is what I'm supposed to communicate. I do because my job is to help you. So I'm not going to pussyfoot around. I'm not going to, I mean, especially right now, people that come to see me, do you want to heal or not? Oh, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Does it? Because I, I'm serious. And, and I'm finding a lot of people don't want to heal. It's uh -oh. like they're so attached Funny. to that, that it becomes oh, yeah. an identity. Yes. And, you know, we, we don't see each other. We see all the ideas and the labels that we put label on each other. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, we'll just say a black person, that's a white person, that's an Asian. You know, we see that first. Yeah. We don't see the human first. Mm -hmm. And then the human has to be, you know, is different from our differences complement each other. Yes. We see the human first, but like you said, we're so full of the junk that we just yes. don't see the person in front of us. And so where I work, I see a lot of people and I'm always saying, good morning, good morning, using two languages at the same time. Okay. So you work uh, with the special needs community. And we talked about that. I have a special needs daughter as well as that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I work with the deaf community. And um, there are deaf who, uh, who are, you know, Spanish at home, and no sign language, and then they come to school. So there's Aww. some basic, real basic linguistic needs. And, you know, and to see wow. the person first. And then those needs are just tools, uh, skills that they need to learn, so that they can balance what they need to learn. Mm -hmm. So there's a balancing act that's going on, but you have yes. to see the person first, not the disability, not and the labels. The affection the for me really showed that any labels you have are, they're not, they don't matter. Being a mom, being a woman, none of it makes a difference. Okay, I know we cut out again. Are we cool? We are good. Oh, man, we keep cutting out, but it keeps recording. That's awesome. It keeps recording. What I'm hoping is that it's saving your side and my side on two different ones. So that okay. we'll cross our fingers. Awesome. Yes. Big cross. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all these labels are essentially, they are not who you are. And if you choose to let them define you and let yourself be hurt by someone's feelings of you, uh, no. <laughs> Okay. I do that a lot. No, you are you. And it, it takes a strength to do this. And part of um, 
where I've been the past couple of years is really finding that strength and finding that power within myself that I am the only one who really loves me and accepts me. And if I can't do that for myself, I cannot really effectively do that for anybody else. So these, well, past two years have been a uh, real transition for me. And another transition, like the infection was a transition. This was another transition or a, a, a powering up. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, yeah, it was, it's, and it's been good. So because of that, again, walking my walk, if you're going to come see me and you're not feeling that power, we're going to find it because I got mine. So I know how to get it. And that's kind of the key. Our ball of fire. Your ball of fire. That's right. So no matter what you're struggling with, it is about finding your heart. And I feel that through the chaos of the world right now too, that is where we are moving to. So it is my job to help with that and assist that on every level. Fantastic. I Thank love you. it. Yeah. I do too. Thank you. And it's, it's a way of, it's one way of reprogramming mm-hmm. because uh, we can't carry that with us anymore. We have to not suppress it, mm-hmm. but integrate it because those experiences, whatever your experience is, they're a part of you. So we yes. have to integrate it, whether we label it, that was bad and that was good. I'm only going to do the good and I'm going to the bad, just sweep yes. it under the rug. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And really coming to that recognition that everything that has happened to you, like for me, the infection, most people would be like, oh, that's so horrible. And, you know, people would ask me, are you okay? And I'd be like, yes. And they're like, what? So knowing that was a spiritual experience and something that I needed and that I would get through it and having trust in a higher power, which I already had, but then having that near death experience, just going, okay, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out and what it's going to look like. And I know it's going to be challenging yet. Are you up for the challenge? Yes. And then the same thing, because of that, if anyone comes to me with, oh, I had this and I'm like, okay, let's turn it around and really see the beauty that it brought to you. So I'm talking about my client with eating disorder. She is so good right now. How you needed that, that protected you. That was your form of protection. And she started to see that very clearly. So our bodies, so even with, I keep going back to the infection, even with the infection, our bodies protect us and our bodies are masterful at showing cancer that it's, that there's something, there's a something that's unbalanced. So you can look at it and go, oh, my foot is horrible. Or, oh my gosh, my foot is showing me something that I need to pay attention to and to work with. So my job is also to pull in every little nuance and bring it to the forefront, every little nuance. Sometimes my clients are like, ah, yeah. Very little escapes my attention. Yeah, I love that you said the body is a master. It and it is because, you know, when you're diagnosed with something like cancer and you say no to traditional treatment, they're going to drop that seed in you. You're going to be dead in two years. And I didn't let it grow because I made all these plans. You know, it's like, OK, now I'm going to get my massage therapy license and I'm going to specialize. You know, I loved cranial sacral therapy and I love yes. energy work with cranial sacral therapy and the and the dura and it's just magical experiences that I have with working on people and just I kept making plans and then it's like oh it's been 10 years oh it's been 15 years oh it's been 21 years you know it's like you keep making those plans and working and as I learn I'm I'm applying it to myself that's the hardest thing is I want to learn all these things but then you have to apply it to yourself (laughs) and what I applied yeah you have to walk the walk you got to walk the walk. And what I found, there's a lot of BS out there. <laughs> First yes. of all. Oh, and heck, heck yes. I will put an exclamation point at multiple exclamation points on that. Yes. Go ahead, please. What I learned as a linguist and how we develop and learn with language, our nervous system is language. Mm-hmm. It responds to language. Mm-hmm. And so as I. And I'll add into there the emotion behind language and the vibration behind language. Okay. Exactly. And it's not the words. It's not the words. People get so offended by words, you know, and it's like, Mm -hmm. it's not the words. We're not feeling each other. We're actually losing that sense because we're so hooked on that word. You know, I need that word or else, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've come so out of balance and 
you know, and you talked about accepting the challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a mindset. And with that mindset, I think, and I see it, that's when reprogramming starts. And it happens on such levels that we don't think about it. You know, our emotions are here and it's on such deep levels. So I love that you made it. It's a challenge. It, it is. is. Challenge. And your hardest challenges can be, are your biggest teachers. If you open the door to really discover yourself and discover why is this happening to me? And it's not, why is this happening to me? It's ownership of what's going on in your body too. I somehow created that infection. And a lot of people go, does that mean I created my cancer? Well, there's a part of accepting that you are in your body. You have to accept what is going on inside of you. And yeah, you're right, Denny, that even just talking about that with you, people are like, oh, no, you, you somehow are creating this on some level. So let's dive deep and figure out what this is versus shying away from it versus you separating it from yourself, bring it in and let's go. And once you bring it in, just like you, beautiful things can happen. Yeah. I and love that ownership, accepting mm -hmm. the choices. So I had to accept the choices I made up until the diagnosis of cancer. And what's interesting is I, I found myself going, I could go two ways Yeah, and go, all right, I accept it. All the choices I made, what can I do from here? The other way was to start blaming. So this was more yes. of an external and then, you know, there was a definite split there, I felt, of either blaming. And when I see that blaming, it tells me there's patterns or programming within that person to go out rather than in, to look at their own choices. Because you can't tell them, well, you know, you created this. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah! we can start asking those questions. All right, what choices did you make leading up right. to this? infection or this diagnosis. And can you accept that as I made those choices? Yes. Those were the choices I made. So how, for you, did you do it by yourself? Did you just make this decision one day? This is, I'm going to keep planning for my future. And that's just what I'm going to do versus being caught up in the blame or in this. How did you, how did you go about Doing I did. I, I found a surgeon who was willing to remove the surgery, uh, move the um, tumor. No way. Yes. So okay. So the tumor was on your back with my husband. <laughs> okay. So the tumor was on your back though. Yeah. Right shoulder. Okay. Yeah, father's side. Um, so I found a surgeon who removed the tumor and then he referred me to an oncologist. And she said, she said in her own sweet little um, she was this tiny little orange. Oh. Woman. She was just so sweet. She's like, honey, you got to have a plan. And I'm like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. So I went to, oh. I became one of Dr. McCullough's patients. He doesn't see patients from my understanding anymore. Oh, but I Dr. Learned McCulla, yes. Mm -hmm. And I started cleansing, detoxing, working on my body. And I realized, oh my gosh, you really did. I was work. a freaking angry person. You know, <laughs> I was in corporate. You did not want to know me because I was a Oh my God, oh. my Chicago girl would come out. Oh. So I realized I was a really angry person. So I had some deep issues and trauma, you know, started coming up and working on it. Oh my God, I'm feeling these things. So please let it release, release. Okay. okay. So is that process, tapping you're doing? I learned why well, I learned EFT from Dr. Mercola, awesome. but that process, I realized first I was aware that something was happening. Yes. Then I talk through it and, and accepting, even though this is happening, even though this thing is happening, I choose. But what was missing, and I learned later, is to give it to my higher self to reprocess, reprogram, and integrate. So that was a fan that I think for me um, really helped heal, let this body do what it needed to do to heal. Wow. So were your Western medicine doctors on your side, the surgeon that removed, or that was, oh, we're, we're done with that. So next my oncologist was on my side. So I saw her so nice. the first, first year, every three months, and then second, third, every six months. And then 
every year. And after five years, she's like, I don't want to see you again. And I'm like, <laughs> Seriously? Oh, oh, yay. It was awesome. So she was so sweet. I loved going to visit her, but she did all her tests, you know, to make sure nothing spread or anything like that. And that's so nice. Cause there are a lot of doctors that go, you need to do this and put the hammer down and I can't, you know, yeah, that's so great. And look at the self-discovery that you went through. How, how are you feeling right now? I feel fantastic. I was just informed today that my contract's going to re- be renewed um, for next awesome. year. So it's like, oh my gosh. And I set my intention to, you know, I, I want to have fun, yeah, travel, meet amazing people and say things like, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. Yep. So all this time I've been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. so this, is how you reprogram. this is how you reprogram, right? Yeah. So was your life like that before? I think I got in my own way a lot. Yeah, that's easy to do. Especially the anger, the anger would come up. And I realized it was from when I was four and things happen and had to work through that and integrate that. Yes. And anger is like a switch. You can be on one path and it it can come on and totally derail you, totally send you down this. And it's really, it can be really challenging to get back, especially if you've had it you know, in your periphery or in your body for a really long time. So good for you. And I know you've probably told your story before and a lot of your listeners probably know it, but I, yeah, I, I love talking about our own stories and relating with that, uh, because I would, I would do the infection again, no matter how hard, like it was hard. I mean, there were times yeah. getting dressed the hardest I was, gift ever. Yes. Getting dressed, crawl on the floor. Cause I had, you know, all this and showering and having plastic put all over myself. So when I look back and go, man, that would you do it again? Yes. I really don't want to do it again, but I would because it was so important and so necessary. So there you go. Oh, let me tell you this, Denny, this is really neat. When I, the first weekend in the hospital, I was supposed to have my high school reunion. So I'm in Ohio, which, you know, my husband works for Goodyear and Goodyear is in the corporate, uh, corporate is in Ohio. So was going to fly down to my reunion in Statesboro, Georgia. So I used to talk like this as well. So I had all the plans made, everything couldn't go. Okay. So Statesboro, Georgia is also a very, you know, religious, and, and this, this is another piece of it that is just to me, mind blowing. I was put on prayer list after prayer list, you know, because I, a lot of people hadn't seen me in a long time. So it, it, and it, it almost doesn't matter how close you are to someone. If someone's supposed to be, and it was a small high school, like 300 people, we had all mostly known each other since first grade. So I knew, I knew these folks on prayer list after prayer list, after prayer list, the energy that I felt from that, when we talk about thought and the power of thought and the power of prayer and all of that, there were moments that were just undescribably good. So I'm in the hospital on steroids and just, I, at some points I was the happiest I had ever been. And I equate it to that, to all these people caring for me and the outreach that came and, you know, oh my gosh, she's got kids in the family and just the food. And it, it just made me step back for a moment and just be grateful for that as well. And emphasizing the importance of community for sure. Yes. Prayer is a state of being and holding whoever you're praying for in the highest light, not worrying about their death or hope they live longer or anything like that. So your thoughts in prayer and then feeling others, you know, this is a true sense, I believe, that we've lost. And I think a lot of people are reigniting that sense of that connection of when you feel others in that state of prayer. It's really powerful and healing. Yeah. yeah so it was really unexpected and beautiful. Fantastic. And, and I, I wonder how many religions were on the table with that, uh, you know, cause down South, there's a lot of Baptists, uh, all forms of different Christian religions. And then, you know, I had all my, my people with spiritual and, and Christianity and all that working as well. So it was, it was just, 
you know, and then having the near death experience, it was just, you know, bringing all of that together and having trust that even if, if, even if some beliefs may be different, that the core of the power of thoughts and goodness that we're all, we, at the end of the day, we are all so good and so kind. And if we're not feeling that way, there are all these programming and how we grew up and what we experienced that get in the way of that. Yet at the heart of it, everybody, everybody is priceless, beautiful, kind, good. And I work on that too, really getting people connected to that, that you are wonderful. Amen. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. So leave your amen in the comments. Okay. <laughs> hear from our listeners. If you're Beautiful. listening in reality programming on YouTube, we have our YouTube channel and our podcast, Heartfelt Awakening. I want to thank you so much. We've got all her information thank that you. we're going to leave in the description for sure. Definitely check out her podcast. Um, just be spiritual boom. Love yes. that. Love that. So definitely yes. check it out. And I want to ask you a question. Sure. Um, it says with the subsidiary of Eden with Ghostbusters, what's yeah. that? So in working with spirits, I also cleanse clean houses. And I'm so glad you brought this up, Denny, because I'm not your typical, oh my gosh, you've got, we've got to clear this evil out of your house. Okay. There might be some things that are pretty intense. And I encountered that recently. Yet I go in with love and I have seen confronted, I guess if that's what you call it, pretty much things that you can't even imagine. And once you go in with love and basically see that entity or whatever you want to call it and not be scared of it, it changes right off the bat. So it doesn't mean that their form changes. Their form may still be scary, yet because I'm not scared of them and see them just like you see human beings, they can relax and I'm able to work with it in a totally different way than I, you've probably seen TV shows where people come in and, Oh, this is horrible. And, um, I, I take a totally different approach to things. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Energetic. Definitely. Definitely. There's energies in houses that sometimes I've seen um, people bring home energies, you know, yes. bring energies with them, you know, yes. there's nothing you can do, but fascinating work that you do. Keep doing that amazing work. Thank you. Darling. Thank you. I will. Yeah. Thank you. So <laughs> listeners, I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments what you loved and let me know what you would love more of. And in the meantime, <laughs> keep being amazing. Thank you.